Hi guys, I'm gonna walk you through the answers to the cellular communication packet that was assigned on Monday, okay? Um, this bad boy, right? All right, so let's start out here. Question number one, has you matching the shapes with the labels? I'm just gonna hold it up so you can see, right? Cells, the circle, the signaling molecule, the ligand is the little guy with the um, dots in it. Sorry, it's a little bit fuzzy, but the receptor is like the little half circle that's grayed in and the little two lines that look like a pause button, that would be the membrane channel, okay? Um, the shape of the ligand and the shape of the receptor are related. This is question two. That would be they match or kind of like a lock and key, right? They like perfectly fit together. If one is like this and the other is like this type of thing. For question three, um, close proximity, that would be both B and C. Okay. Number four, that would be D long distance. And number five, you would need D again would require a longest life ligand because it's got the farthest to travel. So it can't like break down super quickly for number six, then, uh, to go back and label them. Um, a would be autocrine B. So auto means self, right? So it's going to self signal juxta means like next to like if you juxtapose something you're like comparing two things next to each other right so b is juxtacrin c is paracrine that's short distance and d is endocrine okay uh within it's para nearby endo within but it's uh further than just nearby okay so a autocrine b juxtacrine c paracrine d endocrine All right, number seven, do all ligands have the same chemical structure? No, because then it would be confusing because if your cell got, it would confuse the signals, right? Like you could have one signal that tells the cell to start dividing, but if the ligand to stop dividing was the same shape, the cell wouldn't know if it's supposed to divide or not divide, right? So the ligands must be very particularly shaped so that each message comes with its own specific, specifically shaped ligand. Does that make sense? Otherwise your cell's going to be confused. So it's not going to know what to do. Number eight, a quorum sensing. That's going to be paracrine. Okay. The signal doesn't need to move far. It just needs to move to adjacent or nearby cells for B with the plant cells and the plasmodesmata. That would be juxtacrine because the cells are actually touching. Um, for C morphogens, um, this would be paracrine. Um, the ligands are only traveling the length of a small embryo. So they're really, really close, but the cells are not necessarily touching them. I'd have to go around to the other side. D is going to be endocrine because it's traveling throughout the body. Number nine. Okay. Pheromones. Yes. So the egg actually releases some signals. So the sperm knows which way to go, which is uh, kind of crazy. And one might think that it's traveling not very far, but when you consider the size of a sperm and the size of an egg, when you consider the distance you have to travel, it's actually quite a long way. So this is actually endocrine. Um, it's okay if maybe you put paracrine, um, cause you might, you know, not know, but, but relatively speaking, it's a long distance, which is why the egg needs to release some, um, hormones because otherwise the sperm wouldn't know how to get there. That's how far away it is. Um, B, they're releasing their own growth hormone. So that would be autocrine, right? They're released and received by the same cell. Um, number nine, C, neurotransmitters. That's going to be paracrine. It's got to travel that short distance across the synapse to a neighboring neuron cell. And D, um, this is going to be endocrine because it's going to go throughout your body. So it's going to be produced by your brain and then received by your thyroid. Uh, yeah. And your thyroid is like in your neck. Number 10. Okay. We want to prevent communication. So what could you do? You could change the shape of the ligand. You could change the shape of the receptor. You could block the receptor. You could somehow block the production of the ligand so that it didn't get made in the first place. Something like that. Um, number 11, this is kind of the opposite. We want to enhance communication. So we could make more ligand. We could make more receptors. We could do some kind of like artificial ligand to increase the concentration. I don't know, something like that. 
Okay, now on to the extension questions. Um, okay, how might scientists use cellular communication systems to show evolutionary related between species? Well, if you look at lots of some different species and they have similarly shaped or structured ligands and receptors, maybe they could have common ancestry, right? So you could look at which species have similar ligands and maybe be able to trace back some evol evolutionary lines there. Um, number 12, ooh, going back to unit one, I like it. Why would a nonpolar lipid be helpful? Because it could pass right on through that cell membrane, diffuse right on through. And so if it can do these right on through, you don't need a receptor protein because it can just pat, go straight on in. And number 13, you, it could be lots of things that could cause a cell to release a ligand, light, temperature, age, stress, a signal from another cell, sensory triggers, like smell, touch, taste. I already think maybe I said taste already. Um, hormones. I don't know. Any one of these things could cause a cell to release a ligand. Okay. So that's it. Hopefully not too bad. Main thing to understand, we've got the four different types and that, you know, and how they're different and that the ligands and the receptors are specifically matched up so that, um, you know, when a receptor gets a ligand, it knows the exact signal that's sent. Okay. Um, if you have any lingering questions, please bring them to class. Otherwise, hopefully this made sense.